Gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey, is recognized for whatever questions he cares to address to the panel. I thank the chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Raskin, you, you weren't proposing that we go back when you extolled the virtues of allowing people who weren't citizens to vote because they own property. You're not suggesting to go back to those rules, are you? No, no I was just trying to explain the history of it because for most of our history and in most of our states, non-citizens have been granted the right to vote, just like non-citizens. If, oh. if they owned property? It, well, no, no, not exclusively. Like, there was a period called declarant alien suffrage before the Civil War where the rule in most of the Midwestern states like Minnesota and the Western states was if you declared that you were on the pathway to citizenship, they would allow you to vote either in local elections or local, state, and federal, would, depending on that. If, if, the, um, if these provisions that are, were passed by the local D.C. Um, elected officials went into place, <laughs> is it true that... An illegal immigrant who's a felon could vote in D.C.? This I don't know. You might be more versed in the legislation than me. I don't know. Most of the jurisdictions that have it, it's for uh, non-citizens who are lawfully present. For example, in Maryland, a bunch of local jurisdictions in Montgomery County allow it because there are a lot of foreign diplomatic people and embassy personnel and people work at the World Bank and the IMF, and they've always been allowed to vote in their local school board elections and stuff like that. But it would allow illegal immigrants to vote in D.C.? I just can't answer. I don't know. Uh, all non-citizens. So I assume if they were willing to dare to put their name on a public list like that, it sounds like under the D.C. proposal they could do, you, they could do it. Do you have an estimate of how many um, illegal immigrants are in D.C.? I do not know that. Mr. Comer, uh, Chairman Comer, do you have an estimate of the number of illegal immigrants in D.C.? and? who might be able to vote because of this? The Washington Post says 50,000. 50,000, 50, okay. Uh, and isn't it true that felons can vote under this, under the DC rules that are? Um, I, I'm advised yes. It, seem, it seems to me like we could be in a situation, unless it's expressly prohibited, uh, where illegal immigrants who are felons can actually vote in, in local elections. That seems pretty darn inclusive. Is that something you support? I, I mean, asking. George Santos is in Congress, man, so it's a big country. And, uh, you know, put it this way, they cannot vote in D.C. in federal elections. So they would not be able to vote for Eleanor Holmes Norton or to run for the non-voting delegate position. It's only in local elections, as I understand it. Um, Chairman Comer, uh, what's Mayor Bowser's position on the, the legislation that that's, we're disputing here today with these two resolutions? She, she vetoed. She vetoed the, the voting rights. She, she, she vetoed the criminal code. Uh, she just didn't. Signed the, the voting rights, so she didn't <coughs> support either bill. Um, and, the, and the union, police unions, are, are supportive of both of our resolutions and opposed to DC bills. So. What, why do you think the police unions, who uh, presumably they vote in DC as well, <laughs> uh, and support home rule, why would they be opposed they, to they this? Don't, Too lenient, too lenient. Uh, that's why the police union's opposed to it. And then, you know, talking about the courts, the jury trials and stuff, Congress does have a constitutional role to oversee D.C. legislation. And we fund the judiciary in Washington, D.C. That's funded by Congress. So, you know, we, we do have a, a say in this. And I think that if you if you listen and, and you know the Washington Post, the mayor, the law enforcement union, they're all opposed to what the DC Council has done and supportive of what these two resolutions are. Um, Mr. Raskin, you, you're not suggesting that what we're doing here by reviewing the, what the DC elected officials have chosen and, and um, passing a resolution 
to countermand it, to undo it. You're not suggesting what we're doing here is unconstitutional, are you? No, I don't think it's unconstitutional. Uh, but, but that's why people want statehood. I mean, I think most people on the panel represent uh, states that used to be jurisdictions that could get kicked around by Congress routinely on matters, and they don't even you know, get to speak for themselves. So I, I just think as a matter of basic democratic civic respect, we should allow them to uh, have their laws. These are you know, some, some of these uh, provisions in the criminal justice provision, code provision, as I showed just looking at one, carjacking, are far more stringent than those in the states that we represent. Um, and, and the, you know, the non-citizen voting thing also, as, as I said, is exactly I understand, in a lot of places, you know. understand your preferences. Um, These are not my policy preferences, by the way. My only preference is for us to stay out of it and let them have I, I understand things. that's a preference of yours. Yeah. But Mr. Comer, Chairman Comer, makes a great point that this, this is our constitutional authority and prerogative here uh, to review what they've done. In fact, uh, what we've done to let them go ahead and elect folks and, and vote on these things is more than the Constitution granted them. It did, it's not prohibited in the Constitution to let them do this, but it's certainly reserved, and until the Constitution changes, and, it, and I know you would prefer statehood, but we don't have statehood. So in the absence of statehood, we have the Constitution as it stands, and this is our prerogative to vote on this. And uh, I support these two measures, and I support the rule and I yield back to balance my time. Thank you. Gentlelady from New Mexico, Ms. Ledger Fernandez, recognized for questions. 